Where do eggs help measure health? How would you cut this half-inch steel plate? Which busy highway is icebound four months a year? Industry on Parade. Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. The ultra-modern resort hotel, symbol of Florida's most rapidly expanding industry, the tourist trade. Each year, more new, lavish structures go up to accommodate the constantly rising tide of visitors. A tide that doesn't seem to ebb much, even in the summertime. Mushrooming even more rapidly than the hotels are the motels, which boast such facilities as swimming pools, air conditioning, television sets, and an ocean view. But many of the visitors who come here to look and play soon decide to build and stay. One thing shared by motels and hotels, tourists and permanent residents alike, is the need for plenty of electricity. And that is supplied in part by a power plant as well designed as the finest beachfront hostelry. The Cutler plant of Florida Power and Light Company was laid out just south of Miami according to the highest possible standards. Not only in terms of efficient operation, but in terms of aesthetics as well. The fuel used in generating electricity is oil, which is brought in by barge and pumped into large tanks for storage until needed. The striking thing about this generating station is that it has no walls or roof. It's a power plant built out in the open air. And what gives it its beauty primarily are the stark, simple, completely utilitarian lines of the equipment itself, all painted a gleaming silver. There can't be many population centers in the world whose climate would permit the operation out of doors of boilers, generators, and other power plant equipment. Behind the generator, there in the foreground, is one of the few enclosed areas in the plant. It's one of the control rooms from which all the plant's functions, largely automatic, are watched over by a handful of operators. Two men with blueprints are plant superintendent Edward Perch and company president and general manager Robert Fite, who discuss plans for centering even greater control of operations at the fingertips of the operators. Already, airflow, oil flow, temperatures, pressures, and a hundred other factors are constantly visible, constantly subject to correction. Even the appearance of fires in the boilers, raging fires of 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, can be observed in air-conditioned comfort by means of television. As Miami and the other population centers of Florida continue to boom, in population, industry, and commerce, they're fortunate to have an adequate supply of that indispensable growth element, electricity. Provided by a privately owned utility which foresaw the big future in store for the state and prepared for it in plenty of time. America's new frontiers are pushed back every day somewhere in this country through research. Each year, industry spends two and a half billion dollars in research to discover new products or improve those already on the market. These new and improved products mean better and less expensive things for all of us. But more important, they mean more and better jobs with an ever greater chance for better living for everybody. This can happen only in America, where industry is free to experiment, where men know they can refuse to accept limitation, where we have a competitive enterprise system in which nothing is impossible. For 300 years, the medical profession has been determining human body temperatures by means of thin glass tubes called clinical thermometers, deriving from those temperatures very important hour-to-hour -hour information about the body's state of health. At industrial plants like that of Medical Research Institute Incorporated of Cincinnati, even venerable, well-proven medical tools like the thermometer undergo endless testing and study for possible improvement. Here being assembled is the result of the research carried out by this organization, an instrument called the thermometer, which applies the principles of electronic heat measurement, 
long in use by industry, to the measurement of body temperatures. We see a unit being tested for accuracy by being tied in with a heat source whose temperature is controlled to within hundredths of a degree. Readings are determined not by a column of mercury as in a conventional thermometer, but by tiny uncanny devices called thermistors. In actual use, the highly accurate readings are transmitted from thermistor to dial by power from these little mercury batteries, which are said to be good for anywhere from 100,000 to a million readings. Now, assembly is completed. Here being prepared is the metal probe, the part that comes in contact with the body. Into it goes a minute thermistor. The probes are tested and calibrated with the same degree of accuracy as the thermometer proper. Then the electrical leads that will link the two are welded permanently together. Now with wires all attached, the open end of the probe is sealed off. Still another test, this time to make sure the finished probe not only detects but also reports temperatures accurately. To give the instrument maximum usefulness, a special board has been devised on which is mounted equipment used by the nurse in recording not only a patient's temperature but also his pulse and respiration and other data. A stopwatch fits into its special holder. At Cincinnati's Bethesda Hospital, the new idea is demonstrated to department heads who decide to give it a long, careful trial. In medicine, nothing can be accepted any other way. We'll probably hear more about the electronic thermometer that doesn't have to be shaken down, can't break, can be used in the dark, and gives its readings instantaneously. A two-inch cookie is cut out of a steel plate by one of a battery of automatic oxyacetylene torches. Roughly the same end result could be accomplished in any one of several other ways, for the engineers of our machine tool industries never stop developing new methods of processing metal. Here it's grinding and milling. Here, a brass cutting tool that eats its way accurately through a much harder metal by arcing electricity across the narrow gap that separates them. The techniques, as we said, are many and various. But as machinery manufacturers like W.J. Savage Company of Knoxville well know, the specialized problems of metalworking industries are even more numerous and more diverse than the means of solving them. This company's answer to a great many of those problems is a piece of equipment called the nibbling machine, one model of which we see being assembled here. A finished machine is put to the test on a piece of 3 8 inch steel plate. A powerful cutting tool bites through the plate rapidly and smoothly without distorting or oxidizing it, without throwing sparks or leaving jagged edges. This machine would appear to be ready to join the thousands already in operation in factories everywhere, nibbling their way through miles of tough metal of all kinds every working day. As here in the machine shop of a soybean mill, where an odd-shaped opening must be cut in the center of a fairly large plate of steel. The cutting tool snips its way along the chalk line following sharp corners and gentle curves with equal accuracy and speed. The work is finished. No more machining necessary. The part is ready for installation. Another job accomplished by one of those industries whose products are never seen by the general public, but whose skill and ingenuity in serving other industries 
are essential to the continuation of our way of life. Today's management recognizes that human progress must go hand in hand with mechanical and scientific advances. Thus, hundreds of manufacturing companies provide positions for handicapped persons so that they, like all of us, may gain the human dignity and personal satisfaction of being productive and earning a good income. Properly fitted to his job, the handicapped worker usually proves that he is equal and sometimes superior to other workers in work performed, attendance, safe working habits, and attitude toward his job. Industry welcomes physically handicapped workers. One of America's busiest highways, the Great Lakes, largest body of fresh water in the world over which each year ply hundreds of ships of ocean-going size, carrying millions of tons of grain, automobiles, farm machinery, lumber, limestone, and especially iron ore. In Cleveland, as in the other big steel centers ringing the lakes, the ore, that which isn't used immediately, is stockpiled for the four months of the year when the lakes are impassable because of ice. At the first sign of a thaw, in early April, a Coast Guard icebreaker leads the first ore boats through the Sioux Locks, linking Lake Huron and Lake Superior. There are still many inches of ice on Whitefish Bay, and the ore carriers must stay close on the tail of the cutter, for the broken ice can close off the channel and freeze solid again in a matter of minutes. Our cameraman goes aloft in the cutter's helicopter to see what the single file procession through the bay looks like from above. Why the big rush to get the ore moving before the water is even cleared? Well, the demand for steel is greater than ever, and in expanding their facilities to meet that demand, the steel company's requirements for ore are also greater than ever. Before another winter sets in, these boats, together with the other carriers of the various Great Lakes fleets, will have transported between 80 and 100 million tons of ore to the mills. Waiting for the boats in the Lake Superior ports of Duluth, Superior, Two Harbors, Port Arthur, Marquette, and Escanaba are long trains loaded with ore brought down from the Iron Range. These roll out onto loading piers where, when the boats are in position, chutes are lowered into holes and what is perhaps the most vital of all minerals begins to flow down on its way to become steel.